Good evening. Welcome to our service. Let's all stand together if you are able. Grab our psalm books, 523. 523. Let's sing it together as we're finding our place. Victory, Jesus, on that first verse. Let's sing it out together. I heard an old, old story. How a Savior came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary to save the wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sin and won the victory. Happy birthday to Brother Adrian Torres, Vanessa Torres, Jennifer Esposito, Kaylee Snyder, Victor Torres, Anthony Him, um, Victor Torres, Victor Torres, yeah, I said Victor Torres. He is eight and he is single and he's not ready to mingle. Talking about Victor Torres. Brother Adrian is not single, he's taken. And we feel sorry for his wife, okay? Uh, so, anyhow, let's sing happy birthday to him. Brother Nick? Yeah, I got it. Here we go. Let's sing it out. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to all the... Uh, people we had just mentioned, let's uh, go together in prayer. Father, we praise you, Lord, that we have the victory in you, Lord. Uh, it doesn't matter uh, any burdens that we have, the trials and the troubles that we have, or whatever we face, we could rest assured that it, there is victory in what you've done for us on the cross. We pray, Father, that you bless today and just be with us as your word is being preached. And we pray, Father, that you help our hearts to be tender and help it to be right. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please remain standing. We'll sing our next song, 572 in our psalm books. 572, in my heart, there rings a melody. Let's sing it out together. On that first verse, I have a song that Jesus gave me. It was sent from heaven above. Oh, 
seated. Before we get to our announcements, we do have a missionary with us tonight, and he's going to present. Of course, we are always honored when we have uh, missionaries uh, passing through, and they're able, especially when they're able to present. I don't want to neglect to mention Brother Russell, one of our missionaries, is here with us this evening. Thanks, passing through, picking up your daughter, taking her out. Thank you so much for being with us here tonight. And we have the Balingit family, and they are going to Nova Scotia. How many of you remember, well, we, sh- we should if we pray through our missionaries, uh, brother, uh, uh, brother and Mrs. Bowie, Brother Tom Bowie, and uh, this is his brother-in-law, right? And so the parents are back here. I was just, let, I was just talking to him before the service. Uh, you know, it's, it's also a sacrifice on the part of the parents. They've got one couple out in, I believe it's Malaysia, right? Singapore, one, one, one of those uh, countries. Indonesia, that's right, that's right. Um, and so uh, that's that. And then they're going to Nova Scotia, and then you have another son preparing to be a pastor. And by the way, that's a good, uh, that's a good example for us. That he's, he's not a pastor, just a, a layman in the church training arrows to be sent out into the Lord's work. And so thank you for being with us as well. Brother Belinket, come up, say a word, show his presentation, say a word, and then we'll have some announcements. Good evening, church. It is a privilege and an honor to be here tonight. We are so excited uh, to be here. As as was mentioned, uh, this is my wife's first time. She's sitting right there. Her name is Grace. Uh, We have two boys. Uh, My son is two and a half. His name is Bryce. He's probably making a terror in the nursery. And then I have another son. His name is Jace. He is one month old, and he's already faithful to church. Amen? (laughs) We are so thankful to be here. And uh, my grandparents are here. They are faithful members of this church. And so... uh, Believe it or not, I've been here many times. I've, I've attended services. I fell asleep in the back a couple times. Uh, but it is exciting as an outsider to be back here, to be in the new building. Uh, what a blessing this is. And that we are just admiring it, soaking it all in. And it's such a privilege uh, to be here and spend the service with you guys. As mentioned, we are the Bellinga family. The Lord has called us to Halifax, Nova Scotia. Uh, just a curious, out of curiosity, how many of you have ever been to Halifax, Nova Scotia? No hands. Okay, so whatever I say, so I can make something up and you totally believe me about Halifax, right? It is a beautiful, beautiful city. We are so excited the Lord has called us there. Uh, at this time, if we could show the video and then I'll come back up and say some closing remarks. Halifax is a city with a rich history. From the major role it played for Canada during the World Wars to it being the main rescue base for the infamous Titanic disaster. This Atlantic city has its fingerprints all over Canada's history. But for all of its accolades, Halifax was historically once considered one of the most difficult mission fields in all of Canada. Immorality, violence, and a general disdain for all things religion due to the influence of war made it difficult for any church presence to survive. Historically, Halifax was once mainly viewed as nothing more than a rough and difficult military city. But over time, things have truly changed. Although the city has always been a major tourist destination, Halifax has now become home to just under half a million people, making it the fastest growing city in all of Canada. There are five major universities that attract students from all over the world, and within the last five years, more and more immigrants have called Halifax home than ever before. Halifax represents over half of Nova Scotia's economy and has become what many refer to as the hub of the Atlantic. This city is growing in every way possible, but as the population continues to rise, there is only one question that continues to linger in our minds. How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? With more and more people claiming no religion, their need for the gospel is clear. Hi, we are the Blingits, and the Lord has called us to Halifax, Nova Scotia. I've been extremely privileged to grow up in a Christian home. And really for as long as I can remember, my parents have instilled in me a desire to seek after the will of God. It was at the age of nine that my family moved to Ajax and we began attending Faithway Baptist Church. This decision my parents made would prove to be a really big decision in my life because it changed the course of where I was headed. It was that same year I accepted the Lord as my personal savior and not too long after, my siblings and I began attending the Christian school. As a young teenager, you know, kind of figuring my way out through life, the Lord had used the influence of my youth leader, my pastors, and the godly friends he had placed in my life to create a burden in my heart to want to serve him. 
At the age of 15, at a youth conference, it was there that I fully surrendered my life to the Lord to serve Him in full-time ministry, but specifically in our great nation of Canada. I was saved at the age of four while my family and I were living in the States. Shortly after we moved to Canada, my dad was called into full-time ministry. Although I had the privilege of growing up in a Christian home, I struggled with assurance of my salvation for many years. It was around the age of 15 while attending a youth conference that I was assured of my salvation and there surrendered my life into full-time ministry in whatever capacity he had me. Soon after graduating high school, the Lord had allowed both of us to attend Faithway Baptist College for the next four years. And it was really during these four years that God had solidified that calling to serve Him into full-time ministry. In the summer of my third year, the Lord had allowed me to intern at Bethel Baptist Church in Westville, Nova Scotia. And it was during that summer the Lord had confirmed in my heart that this is where He'd want my wife and I to serve. And so that's what happened. We both began our full-time ministry here at Bethel Baptist Church, and it was during these years the Lord had allowed us to do and grow so much. It was while serving here that the Lord had continued to burden our hearts about our future. And although we fully enjoyed serving at Bethel Baptist Church, we continued to pray and ask God what would that next step look like. It was during these times of prayer that the Lord had placed a certain desire in both of our hearts about the big city of Halifax, Nova Scotia. We had a deep love for the city, we had visited many times, and it was over the course of talking with pastors, reading the scriptures, that God had really confirmed that this is where He would want us to serve in our future ministry. Hello, I'm Pastor Bob Wall from Faithway Baptist Church in Ajax, Ontario. You know, in Canada, our great need is for church planters, and we pray and we ask God to raise up young men who have a vision and a burden to go and start a New Testament Baptist church. I've known Kelvin for many years and Grace as well, and I would say I believe that they are worthy of your investment. They have a great heart, they want to serve God, they understand the challenges, but they need some help to go. So may I ask you to please pray for them. Pray that God would empower them, prepare them, prepare hearts in Halifax for the gospel that they'll be preaching. Thank you for your consideration. Halifax is the capital of Nova Scotia with a population of just under half a million people. Over the last few years, young families have made Halifax home, wanting to start a new life or career here. Our desire is to see these young families as well as all people come to know the Lord as their Savior. Our goal is to be able to start a local New Testament church right in the city of Halifax, to be able to preach the gospel, see souls saved, and then see them grow in their faith. And while we understand that there are difficulties in a city ministry, we are so excited and so sure that this is what God wants us to do. And while some may call this a sacrifice, we view it as a privilege. Would you pray for us as we begin this new chapter of our life serving the Lord in Halifax, Nova Scotia? as a young boy growing up in my church, probably sitting in the front row just there, and missionaries would come um, probably once a month or missions conferences. And I remember thinking to myself as a 10 or 11, 12-year-old boy, man, they must have it all together. <laughs> they must be so strong, so mature spiritually. And let me just tell you, we are just sinners saved by grace, just like you are. I remember uh, beginning of 2020, when the Lord really began burning my heart about uh, taking that step, planting a church. I fought it for a very long time. I said, Lord, now is not the time. Lord, my family is doing good. We're stable. We have a great ministry. Now is not the time. And I fought it for months and months. And then one day the Lord just put that final nail in my heart as I was reading my, uh, as reading my devotions. And I remember getting on my knees and I prayed to the Lord. I said, Lord, if I'm going to do this, I'm just going to follow you. You better lead, Lord. I'm, I'm just going to take each step that you guide me. And it came, and you know what I realized? That that's really all the Lord wants of us, isn't it? The Lord just wants us to say, God, I may not be ready, but I'm ready to follow you. Yeah. And that's how the Lord really led. And I'm excited uh, to see how the Lord has opened doors, even in our deputation. And, and with so many things the Lord has provided. And I'm so thankful for that. And I'm so thankful that we serve a great God. I won't take too much time tonight, but Halifax is the fastest growing city in all of Canada. And in the last 20 years, there's only one work that's been started there. 
And so there's a great, great need, and the Lord has called us to plant a church there. So would you consider at least praying for us in the back uh, table just behind those doors? We have prayer cards. If you can grab one, pray for us. And we do have uh, stickers that says pray for Halifax with our name on the bottom just for the kids if they want to put in their Bible or, or in their room or something like that. So once again, so thankful for the opportunity to be able to present. Uh, this is an, a great church, and I'm so excited to see what the Lord is doing here in uh, Pacific Baptist Church. Thank you. Just a couple of announcements this evening. Of course, uh, Saturday Prayer and Faithfulness Rally continues this Saturday, 9.30 for prayer. Hope you be there. And then 10 o'clock for our Faithfulness Rally as we go out and tell people about the Lord, reach our community with the gospel. Of course, the shuttle does continue to run. Thank you, those of you that have been right in the shuttle. We need the parking spaces, all right? And this is probably not something that's going away anytime soon. The more we fill this building, especially on Sundays, the more we're going to need uh, people to do that. So thank you, those that have. And if you can, we encourage you to do so, so we can be good neighbors. Of course, our 34th anniversary is right around the corner. We have Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Special things going on to celebrate God's goodness, with God's people. And so, of course, Thursday, we have our special schedule celebration service. Show up early, be some food out there, we'll fellowship, have a little celebration then. That's the 25th. We do have Friday men's meeting. I think that's with Brother Shannon Scott. $10. And you generally get some steak or good smoked chicken or all of the above or something like that. What did Brother Ross say? Men, meet, and message. That's right. That's, it was alliterated and everything. I think he came up with that on the spot. Probably stole it from someone. But uh, we're going to have that. Don't miss that. Don't miss that. Some good preaching, good fellowship. And that's coming up here. It's on Simple Give, $10. And then, of course, we do have our Super Saturday of Soul Winning. Uh, breakfast provided. We must be a Baptist church. It's all about food here, right? Thursday, food. Friday, food. Saturday, food. And I think Sunday, between services, more food. And it's all free. And so, no, nah, someone's paying for that. But uh, anniversary service, that's, uh, that's on the 28th. And there will be ice skating and fellowship right afterwards. And then uh, two more singles retreats, September 22nd through 24th. Pastor Bob Gray Jr. is going to be there with the singles. And so uh, the, the singles, that's the future. They're going to be the future moms, dads, husbands, wives, ministry leaders. And so we, we, we have a desire to invest in them. And then, of course, if you've not yet gotten a chance to give, good response so far. Thank you. But towards Pastor's gift, do so, please, on Simple Give. Thank you. Let's stand together, please. 384 in our psalm books. Children's missionary offering at this time as well. 384. On that first, let's sing it out together. It's a well of pure water when I'm thirsty and dry, and bread when I'm hungry and worn. When the battle is raging, it's my faithful sword, a shelter from life's troubled storm. It's a light to my pathway and a lamp to my feet. When the world gets so dark, you can't see. And I've not made one change in one word that it says, but it sure made a change in me. This blessed old book that I hold in my hand, it's true from beginning to end. It's a solid foundation where I firmly stand. Sin kept me from it, now it keeps me from sin. On that second, when I think what it costs just to hold it, my hand. It reminds me that I owe a great debt to all of the martyrs who've gone to the stake and quoted with their dying breath. Now its critics are many and believers are few, but there's one thing I found to be true. If you find when you read it that there's something wrong, there's something wrong with you. This blessed old book that I hold in my hand is true from beginning to end. It's a solid foundation where I firmly stand. Sin kept me from it, now it keeps me from sin. Wonderful singer, we'll sing page number two. Come thou found page number two. Let's sing that first verse together. Come thou fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious song and some by flaming tongues above. Fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming 
this time we're going to take the bus ministry offering. I want to share a quick bus ministry blessing with us before we do. Uh, I got a phone call this Saturday. Brother Jay and Miss Baron, they uh, just started helping on our bus route a little bit, uh, doing some sewing and some visits. And it was a blessing. I got a text. They said, hey, a uh, man named Salvador, it's uh, two of our, 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 the teenage guys who ride on our bus, their dad just got saved. And they've been coming for a couple months. I've never met their dad. I've texted him a couple times. I, I typically talk to their grandma. And they said he, he happened to be there. He typically works on Saturdays, but he was there for a party. And they took the opportunity to witness to him, and he got saved. Uh, then uh, not too far from there, uh, they texted me again and said, hey, you know, a couple of our kids are going to be coming who typically come. And they mentioned a name that didn't happen to live there as far as I knew. And, oh, you know, they made a mistake or something. But sure enough, the person they put on the text showed up the next day for church as a first-time visitor. So that was a blessing. At this time, we're going to take the bus ministry offering. Anything that's not designated uh, will go towards the bus ministry. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we thank you for your goodness in our life. Thank you for allowing us to come to church this evening. I uh, do pray you'd continue working uh, in our church through the bus ministry. Pray we'd see many people saved and baptized and discipled through that ministry. In Jesus' name, amen. Are you ready for the 
trumpet. Are you ready for the call? Soon the angels will assemble to usher in the Son of God. Will he come and find you faithful? Will he know your name at all? Every moment brings us closer. do our prayer bulletin tonight, but before Brother Dan comes up to preach to us, uh, I want to encourage you to take this out and go through it throughout the week and, and pray. won't cover it tonight. I did want to ask especially, continue to pray for Brother Chim, of course his wife and each of his children. The most current update that we were given yesterday is they did some, some deeper, uh, they did some deeper imaging into his brain. And they didn't, see any, they didn't see anything deeper inside that would be concerning, so to say, according to the neurologist. Good news, but they still cannot figure out why um, the brain pressure continues to rise when they take the sedation off. So um, pray for wisdom for the neurologist and, and, of course, strength and grace for his family. Of course, pastor's on vacation tonight. He'll be back next Sunday. And so we have Brother Dan going to preach for us tonight. Now, when I, my first year in ministry, Brother Jerry... Um, I, he was in sixth grade, and I was the junior high director, and so I guess the further you get into this thing, the older you feel. But looking forward to it, thankful uh, for him, and just his faithfulness. Dan, come preach to us tonight. Right, we're going to be in the book of Genesis tonight, the book of Genesis, chapter 37. And we're going to start reading in verse 5. I am thankful to Pastor for the opportunity to preach tonight. Uh, this is the second time now I've been up here. I'm just as nervous as the first time. And I feel just as unworthy to be up here. I know many of you out there taught my Sunday school classes and school classes. You probably kicked me out of Sunday school. Uh, brought me by my ear to my parents at Patch. Uh, but it is a privilege to be up here. And uh, I'm thankful for that privilege and grateful to be up here. Uh, Genesis 37. Uh, we're going to start reading in verse 5 and read down to verse 8. This is going to kind of be the springboard uh, for the message tonight. It says, And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Hear, I pray you, this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and stood upright, and behold, your sheaf stood up round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said unto him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us, or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And we'll pray and we'll hop right into it. Uh, Lord, do thank you for the opportunity to preach tonight. Thank you for the opportunity to open up your word and just present this truth. I pray you be with us uh, this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I had no idea what my brother Joseph was going to preach on on Sunday night. Uh, he had... He had actually was the one who had asked me to preach this evening, him and Brother Ross. And I said, okay, well, what, what are you preaching on? And he said, I'm, I'm going to be preaching on the family. And uh, he said, what are you going to be preaching on? I said, well, I, you know, I got a topic that I'm going to be preaching on. And then on Sunday night, I come and he almost preaches the exact message I was going to preach. I was like, all right, that, there that one goes. So this might seem like a sequel to his, his message. And I know we don't watch movies, but maybe it's like that sequel to your favorite documentary that shouldn't have happened. Uh, but we'll see how it goes this evening. Uh, here in the text, uh, we see Joseph as a young man. Uh, he comes from a bit dysfunctional of a home. Uh, you say, man, uh, Brother Dan, I come from a dysfunctional home. My, my guess is you, your home was nothing like Joseph's home. Um, his, his dad had uh, children with four different ladies, and not at different times. They, they were all there together. Um, his brother, uh, several of his brothers were murderers. Um, we know his, that his uh, you know, sister had problems with guys. I mean, they, their family was a mess. Uh, but in spite of the mess, uh, his you know, dad's uh, bad character early on in life, we see that God gave Joseph a dream or a vision, something he wanted him to do with his life. And 
And we see as God gave him the dream there, at times there were people who weren't too happy with the dream that God gave him. Uh, but he continued to be faithful in spite of that. Um, and I'm glad to, to be a part of a church that challenges us to dream. Uh, we, could, we could come to a message like we did on Sunday night, and, and they challenge us to do something with our lives. And not something for ourselves, but something for God. Um, as a teenager and a young adult man, uh, I, or, or first of all, I, I was blessed to grow up with godly parents in a, in a church like this and spiritual leaders who challenged me to dream. Um, as, as a teenager, I was challenged to dream of one day getting married to a godly wife and get, getting married a virgin, starting a family and loving God together. And today that dream is a reality. I'm now married. Um, as a teenager who committed to, uh, uh, to do it right and have his wife's wedding a white wedding dress mean something on our wedding day, Oftentimes, it seemed like a dream that was never going to happen. There was that waiting process. You know, you're a teenager, and you like girls, and it's like, man, am I ever going to get married? You know, I'm not supposed to be uh, getting too close to them or, or that type of thing. And then you get into college, and it's like, man, you know, which one's the right one? And we were, we were given the dream, and the dream was not a reality. It took time for that dream to grow and for God to mature myself and my wife and, and our, our, our families to work together. So one day, we got to the point to where we got married. Uh, now, I'm married to my best friend and, and partner in crime. Lord willing, we, we continue to impact lives and, and, and charge the kingdom of darkness here in Long Beach unless the Lord moves us somewhere else, um, hopefully for decades to come. Um, we were also challenged about raising godly children. And when you're a teenager, it's like, children, I don't, I'm not even married yet. What do you mean ha having godly children one day? What do you mean having a godly seed? Like, what, what does that mean to me? But now two months from now, um, my wife's having our, our first child, and that dream's a little bit clearer. You know, I, I'm going to be able to put my hand on her stomach and feel a little kicking on the womb, um, going into the doctor's office and, and, and seeing the images there on, on the board. It, it's pretty exciting. I, I mean, I always thought people who murdered babies like Planned Parenthood were pretty evil, but I mean, it kicks it to a new level when you see the life in the womb. It's, it's amazing. Um, but the Lord slowly moves the dream along as, as, as we try and be faithful to him. Um, I'm thankful that I was challenged at our church here to live for something bigger than a stack of cash, a couple extra zeros on the end of my bank statement, a flashy car, a house in an affluent neighborhood, or all the other things that this world says are important. I was challenged to be used in the service of our Lord. Um, I like to challenge young people in our church who maybe uh, at this point in time of your life, you, you're sensing God's call on your life, but maybe a carnal Christian friend the allurements of the world, or something else is calling louder for your attention, and you're shunning that, I'd like to tell you God hasn't shortchanged me. I've been far from perfect. I've been far from uh, being who I should be. But I'm thankful that as I try my best to follow God, that he, he, he blesses. Um, I, I stepped on the scale the other day, and I'm, I'm a pretty thin guy. I've always been a pretty thin guy. But I'm 35 pounds heavier than I was in high school. I told my wife, man. And of course, it's all solid muscle. Uh, but... I've never been hungry. I've got a place to sleep. Um, we have all of our needs met and really a lot of our wants. But I would even say if we were like many of our brethren around the globe who maybe had a little bit less or many of the saints throughout the centuries who maybe didn't have as much as we do, it would still be worth it to serve God and follow his vision for my life or for your life tonight. Um, and, and there's nothing beats pillowing your head at night with a clear conscience knowing you're pleasing your master, knowing you're, you're following the one who gave his life for you. Uh, nothing beats seeing someone who is lost and hopeless, living in darkness, come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Nothing beats salvaging lives and eternities altered and futures forever changed. That's a dream worth, worth living for. Uh, we see Joseph here. He was given the dream as a young man. And you would think, okay, man, he's given the dream. He's going to be a great leader. The, the dream was my family's going to follow me, which if you understand the culture at that time, it was a big deal for him to look at his older siblings and his parents and say, you know, one day I'm going to be the leader. That, that was something that, that didn't fly. I know we live in a, in a culture where being disrespectful or disobedient to your parents is acceptable, but that wasn't acceptable in his day and time. And for him to look and to present his dream and say, hey, you know, God wants me to be your leader one day, it was not very well accepted. And after God gave him his dream, it seemed like disappointment after disappointment after disappointment. But because Joseph was faithful when things didn't make sense, oftentimes the dream got foggy, we see at the end of his life God bless him and use him in a great and mighty way. And right now, maybe God gave you a dream. Uh, maybe you're a parent out there and the dream was like, man, one day I want to see my, my grandkids and grow up in Christian school and go off and serve God. And maybe right now you have a wayward child and the, the, you know, the heartbreak and all that goes on. So then you're like, hey, you know, God gave me this dream. Why, why isn't this dream a reality today? 
Uh, maybe you're a Bible college student, you got called to full-time Christian service, and you failed some classes. You got behind on your payments, and you're like, hey, you know, what's going on? I, th- I thought God called me to, to be in full-time Christian service. How come I'm not there today? And I don't know what your dream is. Uh, maybe your dream was, hey, I want to be a, a godly layman in our church. I want to go soul winning. I want to disciple people. And maybe something came in your life, and I don't know what it is today, and the dream's a little bit foggy. Uh, my dad would often call it the death of the vision. And you see many, many great men in Scripture where, where God gave him a vision. David, you're going to be king. And for years, he's, he's hiding in caves. He's like an animal, right? Hiding in caves and in, in, the, in the forest and thickets. But the dream wasn't a reality today. The dream was foggy. There was a death of a vision. I think of, uh, of the Apostle Paul, and you know, he's, he's the great apostle to, to the Gentiles, and he's like, man, what am I doing in this basket here, getting lowered out of the city? Oftentimes, as when God, God gives us a dream and a vision, it's not a reality today, but it will be one day. Uh, parents, I, I would challenge you to dream for your kids. Um, I was listening to one, one of my dad's sermons, uh, as I do often. He said, it's not good enough to have your little Johnny or your little Susie sit next to you to be a decent kid. A kid who doesn't get in trouble grows up and, and, and is a de- decent citizen. Man, but get, get a vision for him to do something for God. We don't just want good kids. We want godly kids. I don't know who you are today or where you are, but start dreaming uh, for yourself and for your family. Um, you know, I talked to a lender um, who actually used to attend church here. He's one of my, uh, a friend of my parents. And he said, man, he said, uh, one of my friend's kids, uh, who, who was an adult young man, got an opportunity to go with, with uh, President Trump when he was uh, going on his election trail, and he got to serve. Um, he would go and he would get them food. He got to travel on Air Force One. He said their family dropped everything. He said he was in college. He was almost done with his college. He dropped out of college. He said they, they put all their finances and resources because they wanted their kids to have an opportunity to go and to serve the president. It was, it was an, it was, it, for him, it was a privilege. And I, I hope that we would, we would, with our children, see the same privilege if God calls our kids to do something for him. May we never be parents or may we never be a church who pushes our dreams and our vision of that which God has for us. Um, Brother Oscar Torres, he, uh, he drives our bus for us for teen selling during the school year. And him and his son worked toor- were working towards uh, a career that they had kind of, kind of talked about and they both thought they wanted for his son. And, I would, you know, as he would drive, I would talk to him and say, hey, you know, what's going on with, you know, with your son's career? You know, hey, he's taking this test, and he's doing this, and he's doing that. And just before his son was about to, to, to be accepted for that career that they had, I mean, for years planned and, and got ready for, his son came to him and said, hey, Dad, I think God wants me to, to, to serve him full time. And then for, for, for Brother Oster, he could have been like, hey, you know, what, what about all this uh, effort and planning? You know, it would have been a, a job with, you know, good benefits and, and, and a nice package for you. What, what about that? But he immediately said, hey, if that's what God wants you to do, I support you 100%. And may, may we be that type of church uh, to where if God calls, calls one of us from among us to do something greater for him, we support that. Um, and a couple things here today. Um, as, as we're on this journey dreaming, um, Sometimes, again, things get foggy. There's the death of the vision, uh, as Joseph did here. But I would challenge us as dreamers, for, let's check ourselves in these four areas um, to, see, to see how we're doing uh, when times get hard. Uh, first of all, dreamer, how is your purity? Uh, we see the life of Joseph. He, uh, if, if you're familiar with the story, um, he was sold by his own brothers into slavery. He got the dream he was going to be that great leader. And I mean, what a disappointment, right? Um, I've gotten into some scuffles with my brothers. There's five of us, so there, there's plenty of uh, brothers to get into scuffles with. Uh, we were playing some basketball a couple weeks ago. I know Brother Angel was in there. He said, oh, man, some brotherly love, right? You guys, you guys are getting into it a little bit with basketball. And I've gotten into some scuffles. We've had some bad blood at times, but I couldn't imagine one of my brothers, or, or even worse, all of my brothers taking me and selling me into slavery. Now, that, that's, that's a terrible place to be in. Um, and, and we, see, we see the disappointments. We know he was, we, he was sold into Potiphar's house as a slave. Like, man, I, I thought I was my dad's favorite. Now I'm here, sold as a slave. And we pick, we pick up the passage here in Genesis 39, verse 7. It says, it came to pass after these things, um, he had been sold into slavery. Um, he was kind of a successful slave, if that's a thing. Um, he, his master kind of gave him more responsibilities, kind of put him in charge of everything in the house. And in Genesis 39, verse 7, it says, and it came to pass after these things, that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wotteth not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. Um, 
And, and we see here that, that uh, Joseph had a big temptation. He was a slave. No doubt in his mind, man, I'm never getting married. You know, uh, I'm never going to be able to have a family. And I'm sure this temptation that he encountered was very hard for him to push away from. Um, I'm, I'm sure he's like, man, uh, you know, people with power and money typically don't get an unattractive spouse, right? I'm sure Potiphar's wife was attractive, and I'm sure it, it kind of striked his ego a bit. Like, man, dude, this, is, this, is, this is the master's wife, and she's looking at me. And no doubt that was alluring. But he had enough fortitude even when the vision wasn't a reality today, even when it was a little bit foggy, even when things seemed to not make sense in his life, to stand on his convictions and live pure, even when it wasn't easy. Um, the easiest way to disqualify us from doing something great for God is to, to mess up in this sense. I, I think of Proverbs 6.31, it says, Men do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy a soul when he is hungry. I mean, if someone steals and they're really hungry... I mean, you don't like it. It's like, man, why would you have to take my stuff? Why couldn't you work for it, right? But if someone's legitimately hungry, you're like, okay, you, you stole from me. If you get caught, you know, you're going to get punished for it, but not a huge deal. But the Bible says, but he who uh, committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding, and he knoweth not that he doeth it to the destroying of his soul. Uh, th this is a big one. Um, Pastor often says behind this pulpit, um, if we are going to stay right in today's society, morally, we are going to have to go to extreme lengths to do it. Man, we live in a loose society, don't we? Um, TV, I mean, YouTube, social media, wherever you go, we live in a very loose society. I remember I was, um, I think I was 18 or 19, and we were flying out on a plane, I think it was to Washington for a tournament. And I remember I was sitting there on my seat, um, minding my own business. For some reason, I got separated from the rest of the pack, and I felt like someone's staring at me. Like, this is, you know, it's kind of where you know you get that feeling like, man, someone, someone's staring at me. Um, and I looked up, and sure enough, there was a lady about my age, and she was staring at me. And my brother Joseph taught us, and I don't know if this is okay to say right here, uh, but my, we used to go, we didn't have a lot of money growing up, so often in the summers, my mom would take us to get free lunches at the park. And oftentimes, we were the only Caucasians at the park. And we were there, everybody was staring, and we're like, man, this is kind of uncomfortable, you know, we just want to get our little milks and get out of here. Uh, but he said, you know, if people are staring at you, Typically, if you stare back at them, they, they look away, right? So I was like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm going to try out this method. So yeah, this person's staring at me, and when I stared at her, she didn't stare back away. And long story short, won't get into the details, but I mean, she'd never seen me before, didn't know me from Adam, and she's like, man, we want to go out. And I was like, oh, this is, you know, across the plane, you haven't even talked to me. Like, what's, what's going on here, right? But we live in a very loose society, and if we're going to stay right morally, we've got to work at it. Um, I believe I'm the leader of my house. I, I check with my wife. I, I think she said that I am. I'm kidding. I'm the leader of my house. I believe I wear the pants. Um, you know, that, that's my God-given role. But when it comes to my wife providing accountability with me in this area, really, there's no limits. You know, when it comes to God's direction for our family spiritually, I said that, right? Uh, when it comes to, you know, where God's going to have us and what we're going to do, and we'll pray together about it and, and, and determine it. But when it comes to my wife, if she sees something that's not okay, she has the ability to calm me down on it. Why? Because it's important that we stay clean and pure. Um, I got my phone. She's got, I was going to say that she has my password. We have the same password. She's allowed on my phone anytime. And you say, man, you don't, doesn't your wife trust you? I said, yeah, she trusts me because she's allowed on there to check it, right? Uh, but it's important that, we, that while we're seeking God and while we're, while we're pursuing the vision, that we stay clean and pure even in a world that's not. Uh, college students, maybe it's, a, it's at work and there's that guy or that girl who's winking at you. Be careful. Um, high school student, be careful who you text, who you follow, uh, who you game with, who you're spending extra time with. We got we to be careful. You know, father or husband, you're out there working hard to provide for the family. Be careful uh, what temptations come our way. Oftentimes, people think they can play with fire and not get burnt. I remember my brother Joseph, when he was a new Sunday school teacher at our house, uh, he, he had an activity over at our house on Wardlow. And everybody came over. He was like, hey, Dan, you, know, you want to start a bonfire for us? we got some marshmallows for the kids. I'm thinking, I mean, I never went to Boy Scouts, but I, I could start a fire. And I, I was, you know, trying with some matches and a lighter, you know, trying to kindle a little bit, little fire. And it wasn't happening. And I tried, and I tried, and I tried. And it just, it, it wasn't happening. I was like, okay. So in the shed, we've got, we've got all types of equipment with gas. Well, our gas tank was empty, but we had a... Um, a hedge trimmer that had gas in it. I was like, I'll just dump a little gas in there and we'll, we'll start it up. You know, we'll, we'll be good to go. And I went and I, I poured a little bit and just like you, you see on the documentaries that you watch, um, I mean, I saw, I poured a little gas, the fire shot up into the engine. So I've, I've got this thing in my hand. It's, it's, it's on fire. I go to throw it and it spreads gas over the whole backyard. 
my brother, you know, new Sunday school teacher, he's got all his people there, and we got a big fire in the backyard. I'm like, oh, man. Then this thing's in my hand. I'm like, man, I got to throw this. So I, th- I throw it. I mean, it, it totally disintegrates the, uh, the, uh, the tool there. I mean, it was, it was a mess. He said, say, what was the problem there? I thought that I was going to toy and play with fire, but it wasn't going to hurt me. Right? I, I, I could take the risk, but I'm not going to have to suffer the consequences. And many of us are like that morally, are we not? You know, I'll flirt a little bit. I'll text. You know, I'll, but I'm not going to push it too far. right? I, I'll go just to the limits. But, but it doesn't work that way. We've, we've got to guard our hearts. Um, Next here, not only as dreamers do we have to protect our purity, uh, but second, we have, as a dreamer, how's your passion for God even in the hard times? Uh, Genesis thirty nine twenty one says, But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And if you follow Joseph's life, we see that, man, when Joseph was with his father, he had the favor of the Lord, right? When Joseph was with uh, in Potiphar's house, it says the Lord was with him, made everything he did to prosper. We see Joseph was in prison. The Lord gave him favor uh, with, with the captain of the, the guard. When he stood before Pharaoh, the Lord gave him favor, right? Over and over and over again, regardless of where Joseph was in life, he could have been a, a, a slave. He could have been in prison. Where, regardless of where Joseph was, he still, had, he still stayed right in his life. Um, Joseph's dream was far out of sight, uh, but he never let the one who gave him the dream get distant. Um, and may, again, maybe you're a parent tonight with a wayward child, uh, someone who you wish would come back to God, uh, and, and make it to where if your kids want to come back, they have a place to come back to. Maybe you've invested in people and you've discipled people here at our church, and you're like, man, they're not, they're not here tonight. You know, I wish they were here sitting next to me. Well, now is not the time to get distant from God and, 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 and to ruin our relationship with God to where they don't have a place to come back to. They don't have someone to help them when they come back. How is our walk with God today? How's our passion and relationship with God? Um, Keeping right with God during difficult times uh, is isn't, isn't important, again, so people have somewhere to come back to. And I'd also mention this. If you're going through a hard time in your life, stay in church. Uh, I, I, could, I could not imagine going through what my family went through with, with, with my dad's injury and everything and not having our church family to be there with us. Man, I don't know how many times people come, come you know, pat you on the back. Man, I'm praying for you. You know, bringing meals and, and, and encouragement, coming in here and preaching just what we needed. If you're going through a hard time, stay in church. The worst time to get out of church is when you're going through a trial, you're going through a hard time in your life, and just things just go from bad to worse. So, dreamer, when, when things are foggy, when things aren't going just how you thought it would go, Stay, stay, stay passionate for God, stay serving him, and stay in church. Um, next we see here, um, how is, uh, for, for the dreamers, how is our perspective of hurts? Are, are we bitter? Um, I, we look to Genesis 45, verse 5. This is um, Joseph's brothers had come back. The, the famine was in the land. Joseph was already out of prison. Um, he you know, interpreted Pharaoh's dream. They prepared for the famine that was coming. And now we see Joseph seeing his brothers for the first time. After years, um, you know, he had a little brother who he'd never seen grow up. His parents had gotten old. He wasn't there to be there with them. No doubt a lot of emotions. Uh, no doubt he was thinking, man, what if my brothers never sold me into slavery? You know, what if I got to be at home with the family? What if, what if, what if, what if, right? And we see here in the passage as we read, uh, we'll read it real, uh, uh, quickly here. Uh, Genesis 45, 5 says, Now therefore be not grieved, this is Joseph speaking with his brothers, nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither. For God did send me before you to preserve life. And we see rather than getting bitter during the hard times, Joseph had a forgiving heart. And no doubt all of us in this room have had hurts at one time in our, in our, our life or another. Some of us, no doubt, on greater levels than other ones of us. Maybe it was someone who stabbed you in the back. Maybe it was a spouse who left. Maybe it was, a, again, a wayward child. Maybe, maybe it was someone who you know, promised something to you and you never got it. There was, there was disappointments, whatever it may be. Maybe you thought God was going to, you know, in, in your mind pull through on something that you felt that he didn't pull through on. I don't know what your hurt is today, but if we're going to continue and be faithful and be, be who God wants us to be and make the impact for eternity that he wants us to make, we can't allow ourselves to be bitter. Uh, don't be like a Ruth who left during a hard time. Their family was in a famine, right? She left in a, in a, in a hard time. She was in Naomi. And she came back out of the hard time bitter. She said, don't, don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me Mara, for the Lord's dealt bitterly with me. Don't come out of a trial or a hard time um, bitter because it, hurts, it only hurts yourself and those who God has called you to serve. Um, if the dreamer gets bitter during these times of the death of the vision, they never get the joy of, a, of the happy ending that God has for them. Um, have you gotten bitter at God or someone? Uh, who has hurt you, and now you're sour and bitter, man, bring it to God this evening and get it right. Uh, the bitterness is no, no way to live a life. Um, and then lastly here, 
As dreamers, how proactive are we at serving others, even in the hard time? You say, Dan, shouldn't it be that when you're going through a hard time, people serve you? And that's what the church is for, right? We help each other during hard times. Uh, we, we, we come alongside. But there's no better time to, to help those around us than when we're hurting ourselves because we live in a hurting world, right? Uh, we see it in Genesis 40, verse 5. And they, uh, and they dreamed a dream, both of them. This is talking about the men who are in prison with Joseph. And each man dreamed his dream in one night. Each man, according to the interpre- interpretation of his dream, the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, which were bound in prison. And Joseph came in unto them in the morning and looked upon them, and behold, they were sad. And we see here Joseph in prison is coming and kind of ministering to people. Say, hey, you know, what's going on? I see you're sad today. How can I help you out? And they're like, man, you know, we had these dreams. We have no idea what they meant. And Joseph ministered even in the hard times. I don't, I don't know how many times in my life that hurt this, that God has allowed to have has given me an avenue to help other people. Uh, I remember my, my dad had his brain injury. Uh, we were up on the seventh floor Memorial Hospital. That was the, the neuro ICU. And we had a, a, a bus girl um, a couple years back. She actually moved out of country. And she, she said, hey, you know, could you pray for my mom? She's having a, a, a surgery. It was just a routine surgery. Um, she said, could you pray for her? She's going to have surgery here in a couple days. And she said it was like on a Friday or something. And on Wednesday, she called. And she said, hey, Brother Dan, do you think you could go to the hospital? My mom's having surgery. I was like, I thought you, she said it was on a Friday, but I'll swing by. I don't mind. Um, and she, I said, you know, what, what's, the, what's the room that she's in? What, what floor is she in and whatnot? She said, oh, she's on the, you know, at the hospital is a little different. She said, on the eighth floor or so. And I went up, and I was like, the eighth floor? Uh, as I was looking on the chart, it says neuro ICU. I said, this is, this is not a routine surgery. And I went up there, and her dad actually had, or her mom had the exact same head injury as my dad had. And um, she, she was able to continue coming to the Christian school and continue coming to church. But we were able to help in a little bit more personal way, and her, her and her, uh, her stepdad at the time, uh, to be able to help them through. Why? Because God allowed her to my life. There were times in my life where, you know, I, knew, I didn't know what it was like to maybe live in a single-parent home. You know, I had a, I had a, a godly dad and a godly mom. We had a textbook family, if you will. But as, you know, my dad got sick, it, it was a little bit different. You know, sometimes there's insecurities that come along with that. And there were people that I was able to help, and I was able to say, okay, I, I see why you're going through what you're going through, because of, of, of hurts that God's allowed in my life. And when God, God brings hurt into our life, rather than using it and flipping it and getting bitter, why don't we use it to help somebody else who's in that same type of situation? Um, and we'll close with this. Joseph saved the world, his family, and the chosen seed, who eventually Jesus Christ came out of that seed, because even when the dream was foggy, uh, even when things got tough and it seemed like the dream, the dream was on pause, he didn't drop his morals or his character. He continued faithful to God, and he was able to impact the known world because of it. And I'll challenge you for today. I don't know what the dream is. It's going to be different for each and every one of us. Um, but when times get tough, let's not give up on the, on the vision that God's given us to, to make an impact for him in eternity. Let's stay faithful. Let's stay clean even through those times. And we'll pray. Father, do thank you for your goodness in our life. Thank you for the example of Joseph here in your word and his faithfulness to you in, in spite of, of hard times that came in his life. I pray that like him, we would, we would stay clean and, and moral and faithful to you uh, during hard times in our life. I pray you be with our church family. pray you bring us back safely to church on Sunday. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, thank you all for being here. I guess we'll see you on Sunday.